In this lecture, we'll talk about the anatomy of the respiratory system, although in physiology, we'll spend quite a bit of time looking at the, the way the respiratory system works, and it's um, quite important for the function of uh, the rest of the body. Uh, for the anatomy, we really will just have one uh, lecture that we'll go through um, to look at the different anatomical structures, and we'll touch on a little bit of the physiology as we go, but um, we'll do a lot more when we take physiology together. So if we look at the respiratory tract um, kind of as a whole, uh, we're going to look at it and, and kind of break it up into two sections. So we have what's called the upper respiratory tract, and then we have the lower respiratory tract. Um, some textbooks vary on where they draw the line between upper and lower. Uh, most will agree, however, that the, the larynx or the voice box uh, is kind of the, the last part of the upper respiratory system. Uh, and the trachea on down is the lower respiratory system. I'll just make a, a brief statement about uh, clinically speaking, we typically think of lower respiratory tract infections as occurring uh, below, the, below the trachea, below the bronchi even. Uh, so we think of things like bronchiolitis and pneumonia as lower respiratory tract infections and everything else is typically considered an upper respiratory tract infection. But anatomically, um, and really what you need to know for this course, is uh, to look at that uh, the, lar the larynx, the voice box, as being the end of the upper respiratory tract. So you can see um, we're going to start uh, really from the nose, and we're going to go all the way down to the alveoli. Um, so we have the nasal cavity, uh, we have the sinuses, we have the, the back of the nose uh, where it connects with the throat. That's the nasopharynx. And then we have the larynx, which is the voice box. Uh, and then moving on down, we have trachea, bronchi, uh, smaller tubes called bronchioles and alveoli. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about each of these sections. The function of the respiratory tract, I think most of us think of that first one pretty easily, gas exchange. Uh, we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. Uh, we call that respiration. Uh, and we'll spend quite a bit of time in physiology talking about uh, the mechanics of that um, and how gas does exchange and how gas moves through the body. Um, most of us don't always think of the respiratory tract in terms of protection. Uh, so for example, um, we have uh, multiple hairs in our nose, the mucus in our nose, the, the hairs and mucus in our uh, lower respiratory tract. These all function to capture um, either maybe pollutants from the air or even uh, sometimes bacteria and fungi and other pathogens and uh, kind of collects those and then removes those by moving those up and out through sneezing, through uh, blowing our nose, through coughing. We remove those um, those bad things from our body. And so in that way, the respiratory tract functions uh, as a measure of protection. It also kind of protects us from um, uh, from dehydration by moistening the air that comes into our body. Uh, if the air that we breathed in was not moistened, then, uh, then the alveoli, which are very delicate tissues, uh, may get dried out and dehydrated. So there's a moistening process that occurs through um, the, the respiratory passages that kind of helps uh, protect those tissues. Of course, uh, sound and speech. Um, I wouldn't be able to talk and give you this lecture if it wasn't for the respiratory tract. So I think sometimes we forget that things like the vocal cords are part of that system, uh, moving air through the larynx. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit in physiology as well. Uh, and then lastly, I probably most of you um, don't consider this regularly, that the respiratory system actually functions to help us balance um, sometimes fluid balance, sometimes... Um, um, the acidity of our blood or the amount of acid that's in our body. Um, it can even be used to uh, kind of regulate uh, blood volume and pressure um, along with the circulatory system. And again, when we get to physiology, we'll talk more about that. But there's lots of functions here to the respiratory tract beyond just gas exchange. Okay, so once we kind of get into the respiratory system, particularly when we get a little bit lower down in, in the system, um, like in the trachea and on its way down to uh, where the lungs are, we're going to find a lot of these ciliated columnar cells. So if you remember when we were talking in the tissue chapter, 
Uh, we talked about you know four major types of tissue. One of them was epithelium. And under epithelium, we discovered lots of shapes and sizes of epithelial cells. And one of them were these columnar cells that were kind of elongated rectangular cells. And they functioned good for kind of producing substances and um, holding those substances, as well as allowing for diffusion uh, across the apical side of, of the cell. So here in the respiratory system, we have a very special kind of columnar cell. Uh, so it's still columnar epithelium, but it's ciliated, meaning it has um, kind of like hairs. I mean, they're, they're, if you remember when we were talking about um, um, the cellular anatomy, we talked about cilia being formed by the microtubules, uh, that cytoskeleton within the cell, um, and that, that um, cilia were used to help uh, move, uh, move things through kind of a fluid. And so because there are also uh, these goblet cells or, or mucus cells, you can see here on the picture, um, here's a mucus cell, also pretty much columnar, um, but then, and they're, they're scattered in between these ciliated columnar cells. Um, so these mucus producing cells will produce mucus that kind of traps um, pollutants and pathogens, but if we didn't have cilia, we would have trouble getting that, uh, that mucus that's being made, getting it up and out of the respiratory system, and it would begin to fill up our respiratory passages, our bronchioles. And so these cilia are very important to kind of wave back and forth and eventually move that mucus plus whatever that mucus has trapped up and out of the respiratory system. Uh, as an example, uh, people who uh, smoke, particularly if they've smoked for a while, they begin to damage these, the cilia on these um, um, epithelial cells. And so what happens is they continue to make mucus because the mucus cells are still there and are still producing. But because the cilia are not functioning properly because of some of the uh, substances within uh, cigarette smoke, that mucus begins to build up and it doesn't kind of naturally and gently move up and out. And so what you find is that people who smoke have a chronic cough. They're always coughing because that's the only way that they can expel that uh, mucus from the respiratory passages because they've lost their natural um, cilia, which, which would function to kind of gently and, and all the time be moving that mucus up and out. And so because they've lost that, they have to force it out by forcing uh, air quickly uh, out of their lungs, and we do that by coughing. And so this is one of the reasons why smokers have a chronic cough, or sometimes we just call it a smoker's cough. We're going to see cilia again in the respiratory, not in the respiratory, uh, this is the respiratory system, but we'll see cilia again when we get to the reproductive system in the, in the female uh, along the fallopian tubes, where it functions to kind of help move the egg um, into the uterus from uh, the fallopian tubes. All right, so let's start by looking at the components of the upper respiratory system. And so we'll start uh, with the nose, since that's kind of the beginning. Uh, and we'll see that, of course, we all know we have nostrils, but the anatomical term for nostril is called nary, uh, N-A-R-E, so multiple, uh, we have two of them, so they're called nares. Um, and then we have kind of the area just inside those openings. The, it's kind of the dry area. It's the area where your hairs are. Um, if you've ever kind of looked in the mirror and seen all those hairs in your nose, that's, that's all in the vestibule. And that area functions as kind of a, a coarse filter. So because you have the hair in there, those hairs will filter out bigger things that might be in the air. Um, smaller particles will, of course, make it through those hairs and make it on up uh, farther into the respiratory passage, um, but it will help to block out and filter out some of the larger particles. Uh, then most of the nose is composed of cartilage, and I'm not going to make you learn uh, the names of the different cartilages, um, but I do want you to be aware that basically three-fourths of your nose is cartilage. Um, we call the tip of the nose the apex. We call the top of the nose um, what we would call the bridge of the nose. We call that the dorsum. Dorsum, remember, kind of means back. So you can think of it as like the spine of the nose, so to speak. It's really the only bony part of the nose. It's the part that's right between your eyes. And if you'll just take your pinky and kind of stick it up there, 
and slowly move your finger down, you'll, you'll find where that hard bone ends, that nasal bone, and the cartilage begins. And you'll see it's about a third of the way down the nose. Um, you lose that bone, and it all becomes cartilage. Then we've already learned in um, the bone chapter about the nasal septum, but that's from um, the coming together of the vomer bone and the ethmoid bone. Uh, and then there's also some cartilage that helps bring those bones together and kind of fills in the gaps between those bones. Uh, so that's called the nasal septum. If we kind of move back from the opening of the nose and the external nose, we'll get into the nasal cavity. And most of us don't really consider, I think, how much tissue is up and behind our nose. Um, think about the tissue that's above your palate in your mouth. So between your eyes and your palate, there's all of your nasal tissue, your nasal cavity. And there's um, a couple of functions there of that uh, tissue. Um, besides the filtering that continues, there is also a moistening and a warming of the air. I already alluded to this earlier, but um, all living tissue needs to, you know, stay moist. It needs to be uh, at least have some water content in it. Uh, if you think of, if you've ever gone out, like on a, on a, the day after a hard rain, when the sun comes out and dries everything up and you've probably seen some dried out worms, uh, on the sidewalk, that's living tissue. And of course, worms more than some animals really need, uh, to stay moist. And when they get dried out, they die. Well, the same thing would happen with our tissue. This is why our body is composed largely of water because living cells need water to survive. So one of the, um, kind of one of the jobs of the nose is to keep the lower respiratory tissue from becoming dried out. And so it does that through moistening and also through warming. Um, it would be quite a shock to your lower respiratory tract to receive cold air. And you've probably um, experienced this if you've ever gone out in the winter and had to work hard or even run, those of you who are athletes, if you forget to breathe through your nose and you start breathing through your mouth, uh, you'll start to get kind of a, a tightness or even sometimes a sharp pain in your chest as that cold air uh, rushes in through the mouth into the lungs. However, if you will breathe through your nose and warm that air, it's much more comfortable. So the nasal passage functions to, to warm and to moisten the air that comes in. Uh, of course, we talked about in the special senses chapter that there was also some um, olfactory epithelium there that's important for um, for olfaction, for smelling. Um, there are also turbinates, and we learned the term, I think, in, um, uh, in the bone chapter, we learned the term uh, conchi. That's kind of the bony, what's on the, the bony surface, but overlying that is this um, mucosa, this kind of... A moist layer of tissue that overlies those uh, bony conchi. And so we, we call them turbinates. <coughs> and you can see that there are three of them. There is the superior, the middle, and the inferior, just like there were for the conchi. And they function to kind of streamline the air and then even cause a little bit of turbulence so that as the air comes in and gets into those, it kind of causes some turbulence of air uh, almost to delay the air just just a moment so that it can be moistened and warmed before it heads down into the nasopharynx. So the hard palate here uh, and the soft palate here, that separates the oral cavity, the mouth, from the nasal cavity above. Um, and then you notice when you get back here to the, uh, the back, which is called the pharynx, um, those two areas are connected. That's why if you've ever laughed really hard or sneezed when you had food in your mouth, it may have come out your nose. Uh, I've had lots of stories of people who have, you know, sneezed milk out of their nose or even uh, sneezed out a piece of spaghetti they were eating out of their nose. And that's because those two areas are connected at the back of your throat. Um, so once you leave the nasal passage and you go back to the back of the throat, you encounter what's called the pharynx. The pharynx has three components. The part closest to the nose is called nasopharynx. That makes sense. And the part that's just be just behind the mouth is called the oropharynx for oral, and that makes a lot of sense as well. So if you've ever tried to look in the back of somebody's throat, you know, you've had them open their mouth and say, ah, and kind of look back there with a the light. 
the part that you're seeing is the oropharynx. That's the, the part of the pharynx that is directly behind the mouth. And so we give it the name oropharynx. So that would be this area here. And if you continue down the pharynx, you would uh, get to what we call the, the laryngopharynx. And that takes its name from the larynx or the voice box, which is just uh, distal to it. Um, so that pharynx is basically just a passageway to carry air either from the nose or from the mouth down into the lungs. It's also a passageway as far as the oropharynx um, down to the esophagus for food. And we'll talk about that when we get to the GI chapter coming up next. All right, so to introduce the next uh, part of the anatomy, I wanted to um, give you a, a brief case to help us think about um, how our understanding of anatomy can be useful clinically. So let's talk about Ethan. Ethan is three years old, and he's been coughing for the last two days. So he comes to the emergency room tonight because the mother says he's been having a barking-like cough, um, which was concerning to her, and even more concerning was that he seemed to have difficulty breathing. Um, she noticed that he was breathing kind of fast and had a funny sound. When you see him, he has a mild fever, uh, some runny nose. As you look at him, he does look like he's having a little bit of difficulty breathing, and he's breathing a little faster than usual. And when you kind of quiet down the room, you notice that he has a high-pitched sound uh, to his breathing every time he breathes in. So it sounds something like this. <coughs> that high-pitched sound when he when he breathes in what we would call inspiration. So let's um, move down from the pharynx. So uh, nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, and that's going to bring us then into the larynx. The larynx is kind of the anatomical name for what we would typically call the voice box. So it's going to contain the vocal cords, but it's kind of a, an enlarged area just before you get to the trachea. And it's composed of a few components that you can see here. So there's the glottis, which is just the opening of the uh, larynx. And I'll show you a picture here in a minute uh, where we can get a top-down view of the larynx and you'll be able to see the glottis. So think of the glottis um, a little bit like you think of the pupil. The glottis is really empty space, just like the pupil is kind of like a hole. It's not an actual structure. It's just we have to give it a name because, you know, it's it's something that light has to pass through. The glottis is something that air has to pass through, and so we give it a name. Um, we're going to see the glottis can be opened or closed. Um, then we have what's called the epiglottis. So we'll remember that term epi means above. So the epiglottis is going to be a, a piece of tissue that sits above the glottis, above the opening to the larynx. Um, and it's, it's just kind of a flap of connective tissue that helps um, prevent food that we swallow uh, from going into the larynx and then down into the lungs. So as food comes down through the esophagus, I'm sorry, not the esophagus, as food comes through the pharynx, when it gets to the epiglottis, it pushes the epiglottis down and the epiglottis covers the larynx and then the food slides posteriorly into the esophagus. So the epiglottis is what's used to protect us from uh, accidentally inhaling food, and we call that uh, aspiration. So we would say it prevents aspiration. Okay, then we have uh, two cartilages, and we've talked about these both before in the surface anatomy lecture. Uh, but you'll, you can really appreciate them here in the respiratory chapter. We have the thyroid cartilage, which is what we call the Adam's apple. And you can almost imagine that notch right there, that point right there. That's the part that you can feel when you feel your Adam's apple. You're actually feeling that laryngeal prominence on the thyroid cartilage. Uh, and then we talked about the cricoid cartilage, which is kind of the next cartilage that sits below. And I also mentioned that you can, uh, if you're feeling on your neck, when you get to that laryngeal prominence, the Adam's apple, and you go below and you feel the next cartilage, that's the cricoid cartilage. And right in between the, the uh, thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage is this um, ligament. You don't have to know the name of that. 
But that's important anatomically because that's where we put a breathing tube into people. If we're not able to put it through their mouth for some reason, we can stick it right in that uh, cricothyroid ligament. Uh, it's large enough to hold uh, a tube for breathing if necessary. Okay, this is kind of giving us a posterior view of the larynx. So this would be if you were looking from behind somebody and we removed, you know, their their neck and their all their tissue and let you look at the uh, larynx from a posterior view. This is what you would see. Now you can really see this epiglottis. Um, it didn't look very big on the last picture, but you can see here it's uh, a decent sized piece of tissue. Um, the glottis is going to be this opening in here, and we're going to see better pictures of that later. And you can see how if the glottis folded down, sorry, if the epiglottis folded down, it would cover over that glottis and protect it from uh, aspirating any kind of food. Um, there are no, I'm not making you learn a lot of these other uh, cartilages. So there are several cartilages that help form um, the larynx and really other than the epiglottis, uh, the thyroid and the cricoid cartilage, I'm not making you learn any of the other ones. Um, so you can just kind of see posteriorly. I'll just mention here, we're going to talk about the tracheal rings in a minute. Um, and they go all the way around the trachea. Um, they don't really go all the way around though. You can see how they are disconnected here posteriorly. They don't actually come together in the back of the trachea. And we'll talk about why in a minute. Okay, so here's that glottis I was talking about. <clears throat> so this is now a picture kind of looking from the top down into the larynx. And so this picture that you're getting here is actually from a camera that we would put in through the nose or put in through the mouth. And we would bend it down and we would go into the larynx and we would be able to look right at the top. And this is what you would see. So you would see the epiglottis up here, that flap of tissue that eventually would go and fold over the glottis. The glottis is just this opening, okay? If I was gonna draw the glottis, it would actually just be that part, the opening part. On either side of the glottis are what we call the vocal fords, sorry, the vocal folds, um, or we call them the vocal cords in common language. So vocal fold is the same thing as your vocal cord. Um, and based on how tight and how close or how far apart, how far apart the vocal folds are, it gives you different uh, types of sound. Um, so if it's um, if you have thicker vocal folds, you have a deeper voice. If you have um, thinner ones, you have a higher voice. If they're um, stretched out more, you may have a higher voice. Um, so anyway, you can see how <clears throat> if we look from the top down, how the epiglottis the glottis, which is just the opening, the vocal folds, um, and then again, there's some other uh, cartilages that I'm not making you uh, learn. But here's what the glottis looks like when it's closed, and here's what the glottis looks like when it's open. All right, I mentioned once we get past the larynx, we're gonna enter what we call the lower respiratory system. And so that will begin with the trachea. So the trachea is just a tube uh, surrounded all the way from top to bottom with these um, uh, tracheal rings. And they're, they're just not quite complete rings, as I mentioned. They're, the, the back part of them is left open. And there's a reason for that. So let's take a look at this picture here. So we're looking at an anterior view. So if you look anteriorly, this was the larynx here. And so we're going to start with the trachea beginning here and going down to where it branches into the bronchi. And you can see these tracheal rings, right, going all the way down from top to bottom. And we saw a posterior view, however, that showed that these tracheal cartilages did not come together in the back posteriorly, right? So if we take a cross-section of the trachea, as you can see in this picture here, you'll see... Um, that you've got the tracheal rings here, right? And you'll see that there's an opening here where those that cartilage ends, where there's no cartilage there. And the reason for that is if this back here, this big muscular tube is, this is the esophagus. So the esophagus sits posterior uh, 
to the trachea, or you could say the trachea sits anterior to the esophagus. Uh, and this is really important for swallowing and for breathing, and clinically speaking, um, this position is, is really important. Notice on this picture a couple of things. One is, notice that at rest, so this patient obviously is not swallowing because you just took a section of their throat, so it's from, you know, um, dead tissue. So um, notice, however, that the trachea is open. See all this white space in here? This is empty space, right? That's where air would be moving in and out. And it's open. At rest, the trachea is open. And the reason it's open is because you have those tracheal rings, the, 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 those rings of cartilage that are keeping the trachea open all the time. And of course, functionally, that's super important because we need to be moving air in or out of that trachea all the time. Every moment of every day, air is either moving in or air is moving out. So we want that that lumen of the trachea to be open all the time. And those tracheal rings, they do that for us. They, they are what allow our trachea to remain open all the time. Now look posteriorly at the esophagus here. And what you'll notice is that it's pretty much closed. I mean, there's a little tiny space there, but really the esophagus is closed. And, and that's the resting state of the esophagus. Unless you're swallowing something, the esophagus stays closed. And that's because it collapses um, you know, by the pressure from the muscle all around it, from the pressure of the trachea in front of it, from the pressure of the surrounding tissues. Unless there's something inside the esophagus, it's going to be collapsed. Um, however, when you swallow a bolus of food and that bolus enters, it's going to cause that esophagus to expand as that bolus of food moves through. And now we come to the purpose of having incomplete tracheal rings. So as that bolus of food moves down and that esophagus bulges forward, it's able to do so because you don't have any cartilage in that area. That's a very thin area that is able to be flexible and move in response to a bolus of food that's going down the esophagus. That's why the posterior aspect of your tracheal rings do not connect with each other. It's to allow space for food to pass through the esophagus. One more part of the um, trachea I'd like you to, to know is this uh, part called the carina. So the carina is the part that is right at the part that branches, kind of right at this uh, upside down V. We would call that the carina. You can see your, it's pointing right there. Uh, so that's the carina. It's the branching point. Uh, it's the end of the trachea when the trachea become uh, the right and left main stem bronchi. Okay, so that brings us to the bronchi. And so there are uh, two main bronchi. There's the right and the left, but they are not uh, exactly the same. And because they're anatomically different, it leads to some different uh, clinical issues. Uh, the right main stem bronchus, uh, which is this one here, you can kind of see on the picture, is shorter. Uh, notice how long the left is before it branches. So the right is shorter. Notice that the right is also larger, it's wider in diameter compared to the left. Uh, it also has a steeper slope, so whereas this one's going at this angle, this one's coming at this angle. Um, and so, as a result of being shorter, wider, and steeper, the right main stem bronchus becomes a common site for foreign bodies. So what I mean is, let's say a child, I have a one-year-old at home, as many of you know, and let's say she um, gets a Lego that my older kids have left on the floor, and she's playing with it in her mouth. But let's say all of a sudden she takes a big breath, and that Lego gets sucked down into her trachea. She aspirates the Lego. If I was to do a uh, laryngoscopy where I go down with a, a camera, like the picture I showed you, and try to figure out where did that Lego end up, if it's not still in the trachea somewhere, I would expect it to be down here caught in the right main stem bronchus um, because as it moves down, as she continues to breathe and it moves down, when it gets to the carina, it has a decision. I can go to the right or I can go to the left. Well, things tend to take the path of least resistance. And because the right main stem bronchus is wider, shorter, and steeper, 
it becomes the easier tube for foreign bodies to kind of fall down or be sucked down. And so often when people aspirate, especially if they're sitting up when they aspirate, we find problems on the right side of the lung because whether it's a food that was aspirated, whether it's a foreign body that was aspirated, whether it's just um, vomit um, or stomach acid that's aspirated, it especially if they're sitting up or standing, uh, there's a tendency for that material to end up more on the right, and so we end up getting more problems on the right side of the lung. Okay, another area after the carina and, and after we get to the right and left main stem bronchi, we have an area of the lung that we call the hilum. Now, the hilum I'm going to show you on a, another picture, I think, better than what we can see here. The hilum is an area um, where these main stem bronchi begin to branch, but there are other structures uh, in the same area, and that's why we give it a separate name. So there's a meshwork of connective tissue. You have the main bronchi there that are just beginning uh, to, to branch. And then you've got the pulmonary vessels, so that's you know pulmonary arteries and veins and their branches. And you also have some nerves in that area, and that's called the hilum, and we'll see some pictures here in a minute. So if you look at an x-ray, which is kind of what I'm used to looking at, the hilum is very easy to identify on an x-ray. So it's going to be um, where the trachea um, kind of branches on either side into right and left main stem, right? So uh, remember that air on an x-ray is black. So this is the right lung and this is the left lung. That's why they're so uh, black, because they're full of air. But you can also identify the trachea on an x-ray because the trachea is also full of air, right? It's always open and always full of air. By the way, this kind of circular object is the aortic arch uh, that you can see straight on, and you can usually see that on an x-ray. And usually right after the aortic arch, you will see kind of a splitting, and we kind of lose it. You kind of have to imagine here of the trachea into right and left main stem. But that's going to lead us to the hilum. So the hilum is easy to identify. It's this kind of whitish area that you see on either side, just above the heart. And it's white because it's not all air there, right? There's some air in there because there are some branches of the main stem bronchi. But there's also blood vessels and nerves and connective tissue. And so it ends up taking on a more white color on an x-ray. So if we took a lung and we kind of cut right down here where the hilum is. And then we turn this around for you so that you could look kind of right into the medial edge of the lung. You'd be able to see the hilum quite well. So this area here is the hilum. And you can see that there are blood vessels and there are some nerves and there are some um, uh, bronchi there as well. That's the hilum of the lung. There's one on the right and there's one on the left. All right, let's look at another case. Oh, I forgot to mention to you. <laughs> I forgot to give you the answer to um, the case of, what was that other kid's name that we did? Uh, the kid that had the funny breathing and the barky cough. Um, he had something called croup, and I meant to mention that earlier. And croup is when you get uh, edema or swelling of the larynx. And that's the reason why you get kind of a barky cough and you get a high-pitched uh, noise when you breathe in because remember that the, um, the larynx is where your vocal cords are. And so you get some kind of funny noises when you get swelling in that area. And so it's typically caused by a virus. And so there really isn't anything we can do to make kids get better faster. But some kids will get so much swelling there that they begin to have difficulty breathing because there's so little space for air to move in and out because it's so swollen. And so what we found is if we give kids one dose of a, a particular steroid, that will help reduce the swelling and many of these kids will get better in 12 to 24 hours after taking the steroid. And so even though we can't make the illness go away. We can't make the virus go away any faster. The body has to take care of that. We are able to help with the symptoms and help the child feel better by giving them one dose of steroids. So that was croup, and croup's uh, very easy to diagnose based on the cough and the breathing, um, and then pretty simple to treat as well. Okay, well, let's talk about another case. Uh, this is of Warsame. Uh, 
Um, Warsame is one of my favorite names from our time in Africa because it means um, good news. And typically someone would have been called Warsame because um, their birth was good news to the parents or good news to the family. And often there's a little bit of a story behind the naming, like maybe the, the parents had tried you know, for years to have children and they couldn't, and all of a sudden the wife gets pregnant and this is good news, so they're going to name their child Warsame. So anyway, I love this name, Warsame. So we'll, we'll uh, go through a case with him, and he is 60 years old. Uh, and he's a long-term smoker, so he's been smoking for 40 years. Uh, he comes to see you because he's complaining of difficulty breathing, saying he's having shortness of breath. He's also had some increased cough over the last few days, and his sputum seems to be darker. He's not having any fever or chills or muscle aches. Uh, and when you listen to him with a stethoscope, you notice some high-pitched noises on expiration. This is breathing out. So remember, on the, the previous child that we saw, he had high-pitched noise on breathing in. We call that strider. When you have a high-pitched noise on breathing out, that's usually from uh, what we call wheezes, and wheezes are usually lower down in the lower respiratory system. So the question is, what is going on with Warsame? Why is he having trouble breathing? And we'll come back to Warsame here in a minute. Okay, so we're moving down from trachea, right in main stem bronchus, hilum, and now we're getting into the actual lung tissue. Most of the lung tissue is composed of alveoli, although there are, you know, um, multiple branching tubes getting smaller and smaller also in this tissue. And so you can look at what we would call like the gross anatomy of the lungs, just kind of looking at it, what can you see? And we can see that there's an apex at the top. Remember when we were talking about the heart, it was kind of where the heart came to a point. Now on the heart, it was inferiorly, uh, which was kind of backwards. But here on the lungs, we get back to kind of normal thinking. The apex of a mountain, for example, is the top high point of a mountain, right? So the apex of the lungs are very similar. They're the tops of the lungs that come to a point. Um, we have the base, which would be the bottom of the lungs. And that's also kind of as we would expect. There's a cardiac notch on the left lung because remember the, the heart is not quite in the center of the chest. It kind of uh, moves off to the left just a little bit and so there has to be a, kind of a space for it to sit next to the left lung. That's called the cardiac notch. And then each lung has multiple lobes. So the right lung has three lobes. You can see here the superior, the inferior, and the middle lobe. And the left lung only has two lobes. And those lobes are formed by fissures that kind of um, cut the lung up into these lobes. So because we have uh, three lobes on the right, we're going to have two fissures. So the horizontal fissure is going to separate the superior from the middle lobe. And then the oblique fissure, just as its name would suggest, kind of runs obliquely across the lung is going to separate the inferior lobe from the other two lobes. Um, on the left lung, we have just an oblique fissure, and so that's going to separate the superior from the inferior lungs, uh, lobes of the lung. All right, this is giving you just a view of these same structures, but looking um, kind of medially from a medial view of the lung, um, whereas the other one was giving you more of an anterior view of the lung. So again, if you kind of took the lung off from the middle and turned it towards you, this is what you would see. You can see the hilum again. But now you can also see the three lobes here on the left. Uh, you can kind of see uh, a groove for the esophagus, uh, which you don't have to learn that, but I think it's just interesting that you can see it there. You can see where the heart would be on the left, this cardiac impression. Um, you can see the groove for the aorta. Remember, all these structures are all kind of squished into that same area that we call the mediastinum. And so they're all pushed up against the lungs. And so the lung has to accommodate those structures. All right, I'm also not going to require you to learn these different uh, bronchopulmonary segments. Um, just know that, that we have names for them to kind of communicate with each other what part of the lung is the problem. And you can see the branching pattern coming. So this is the trachea, this is the carina, and then you've got right and left. 
main stem and then each of those then has you know a bunch of branching that happens and they all have names but you don't have to learn those i just wanted to show you the picture as we move down from the bronchi uh, we get to smaller and smaller tubes so we would have main stem bronchus then we'd have smaller bronchi smaller bronchi but eventually we get down to ones that are so tiny that we don't call them bronchi anymore. We call them bronchioles. It really just means small bronchi. And these are the very smallest uh, of the airways. And as a result of being so small, they tend to give us problems from time to time, especially when we're children. When we're young children and they're even smaller, they can get filled up with mucus or they can get edematous from, from viral infections and things like that, uh, and they can cause us some issues. Uh, as we get older, uh, we tend to grow out of some of those issues. But what's unique about bronchioles, besides them just being small, is that they're highly muscular. They're almost completely composed of muscles. So if you look at the large bronchi, we've still got quite a bit of cartilage there, right? And as you move down to some medium size, there's still quite a bit of cartilage. And remember that cartilage functions to keep those tubes open, just like it kept the trachea open. And as you continue to move down, there's still some cartilage there. But as you get down to the, the smaller bronchioles, you'll notice there's no more cartilage. It's really all muscle. And so that makes it a little bit difficult sometimes for those bronchioles to stay open, especially if there's extra uh, mucus or edema of those bronchioles. However, because those bronchioles are largely composed of muscle, the autonomic nervous system has a great degree of control as to how open or how closed they are. So if the um, sympathetic system stimulates uh, the bronchioles, it will open those tubes and allow more air to come in and more air to go out of those tubes. However, if the parasympathetic, uh, parasympathetic system stimulates the bronchioles, it will cause the muscles to contract, which will make the inside of the tube even smaller. So we call that bronchoconstriction when it gets smaller, or we call it bronchodilation when the tubes get bigger. And this will be very important when you get to physiology. So it'd be helpful to you if you can learn these two terms now, bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation. And if you would commit to memory which one is caused by the parasympathetic system and which is caused by the sympathetic system. All right, and at the very end of all of those tubes, so from bronchi to bronchiole, we eventually make our way down to alveoli. Some people say alveoli, that's fine. Um, and the alveoli are what are actually kind of holding the air. And this is the location where gas exchange happens. So all of those tubes from the, from the larynx to the trachea to the bronchi to the bronchioles, there is no air exchange happening in any of those areas. Those are just pipes. They're just carrying air in and carrying air out. No gas exchange is happening. It's all down here at the alveoli where the gas exchange occurs. Um, and the reason for that is two, two reasons, really. One is the wall of the alveoli is so thin that it's going to allow diffusion of gases to happen quickly. And number two, the alveoli are surrounded by capillaries, by blood vessels. And so you need air coming in contact with blood in order to have an exchange of gases. And in the rest of the uh, pulmonary tissue and all of those tubes we talked about, the, the, the walls of those tubes are too thick and there's not nearly enough blood vessels surrounding to, to have any kind of meaningful gas exchange. So gas exchange is going to occur down here in the alveoli. And you can see that they kind of look like bunches of grapes. Um, they're very spherical and that's really important and helpful. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in physiology but they kind of occur in bunches that look like bunches of grapes. Now, if we went down deeper and looked microscopically at alveoli, we would find that there are actually two types of alveolar cells. The ones that we typically think of as, as quote-unquote normal alveolar cells, these are type 1 alveolar cells. These are the ones where gas exchange happens, where oxygen moves out into the blood and carbon dioxide moves in from the blood. That's, that exchange of gas is going to occur in type 1 or across type 1 alveolar cells. And that's all the purple that you're seeing. All these purple cells, these are type 1. 
there is another type, however, called type 2 alveolar cells, and they produce um, a substance called surfactant, which is super important uh, in order to help keep the alveoli open and keep surface tension down, which helps us breathe in and out uh, more easily. So we'll talk more about the mechanics of that in physiology, but for now, I would just learn that type 1 alveolar cells are where gas exchange occurs, and type 2 alveolar cells produce surfactant, which reduces surface tension. So here's a look at uh, kind of the barrier between a type 1 alveolar cell and the endothelial cells, the, the capillary cells that are surrounding that alveoli. And so what you can see, if, if you can imagine that this is a big alveolus, and that this is, you know, a capillary, and they're coming in contact with each other. So this is this is where we can have exchange. So in the in the um, lumen of the red blood cell, you're going to have a higher concentration of carbon dioxide that wants to move into the alveolus, and you're going to have in the alveolus, you're going to have a higher concentration of oxygen that wants to move into the blood. Uh, and this is good. This is what we need. So notice, though, however, how the structure of these uh, uh, two parts, the structure of the alveolus and the structure of the uh, capillary, help provide the easiest possible barrier for diffusion of these two gases to happen. So in here, you've got all the oxygen, and in here, you've got all the carbon dioxide, and the oxygen wants to move into the blood cell. And to do that, it has to pass through the wall of the alveolus and the wall of the capillary. And those are very, very thin. Those are squamous epithelium. So they're the thinnest possible epithelial cells that our body has, which is great. And then in between, so as not to kind of increase the distance any more than necessary, there's a very thin layer of connective tissue that just holds together the endothelial tissue and the alveoli so that they can stay next to each other. And we call that the basement membrane. So it's very thin, so the oxygen is able to diffuse across and the carbon dioxide is able to diffuse across and we can have gas exchange. We call this the blood air barrier. Okay, if we come back to the case of Warsame, so what's happening with him? Why is he having trouble breathing? His main problem is that he has been smoking for too long, and as a result, um, he has lost his uh, respiratory, uh, a lot of his cilia, for example, and so his mucus doesn't get cleared, cleared well. Um, but he also has tissue that's um, um, that started to break down, um, and his bronchi and his bronchioles in particular are um, are more susceptible to either allergens or viruses or bacteria, and they kind of react more severely than you or I might. And so when they get an allergy or when they get an infection, instead of having a little bit of mucus and a little bit of swelling, they make a ton of mucus and have a lot of swelling. And so what that does is it, it kind of blocks up his bronchi. So normally you would have this much space for air to flow in and out of your bronchi, but for Warsame, because he has emphysema or COPD, um, he has so much swelling and so much mucus that he only has a very little space now for air to move in and out. And that tight uh, space is what causes that wheeze, that high-pitched um, sound that we talked about on expiration, that wheeze. Um, and he's also got extra mucus we talked about uh, because his his bronchi are just reacting uh, probably to a viral infection. All right, I wanted to end with just a quick review of the respiratory muscles. We already talked about these in the muscle chapter, but just to kind of uh, put it in context here, probably not a lot new for you to learn. You should already know this information. Um, remember that breathing can occur, uh, breathing in, which we call inspiration, or breathing out, which we call expiration. Uh, to breathe in, we said that the the main issue or the main muscle involved is the diaphragm. So when the diaphragm contracts, uh, it causes the chest cavity to enlarge, which allows air to rush in. Uh, external intercostals are also involved. For expiration or exhalation, mainly we need relaxation of the diaphragm. Uh, 
uh, although there are some accessory muscles like the internal intercostals and some of the abdominal muscles like rectus abdominis. Um, for inspiration, if you have to, when we say accessory respiratory muscles, we mean those muscles that you use when you have to take a big breath. Uh, so if you're taking a big breath in, you're going to need more than just the diaphragm and external intercostals. You're going to need the sternocleidomastoid, you're going to need the scalenes, and there's even some others, but those are the main ones. And if you have to force air out more than usual, you're going to need more than just relaxation of the diaphragm. You're going to also need the internal intercostals to contract and your abdominal muscles like the rectus abdominis to contract and kind of force air out. And again, I think this is not new information to you. Um, we'll talk all, quite a bit in um, physiology about the mechanics of breathing. It'll be a, a whole lecture of its own. But just to kind of simplify it so that you can see what's happening during inspiration, all of those muscles that are contracting are doing two things. They are pulling the um, chest cavity, the thorax, up and out. So you're kind of moving up and moving out in those two directions. Uh, and it's sometimes likened to a bucket handle, that when you lift a bucket handle up, it doesn't just go straight up, but it kind of comes out and goes up. And that's kind of what you're doing when you breathe in. Of course, when you exhale, the opposite happens. And here's, again, just a picture showing you the mechanics of what those different muscles we mentioned when they contract how they move the chest cavity, and how that aids in inhalation or exhalation. As always, make sure that you uh, write down any questions that you have. You can email me, or when we get together in class, uh, of course, you can ask me your questions there as well.